But let's do just that. Let's take some deep breaths in and release all out as we center our hearts and remove all distractions. Would you join with me? Let's take a deep breath in and release. Another deep breath in and release. One more deep breath in and release. Would you be so kind as in a moment of silence to set your intention as that which you'd like to receive from this time that we share together, that you'd like to have the spirit of God speak to you or unfold for you. Just describe and whisper that intention or desire of your heart silently within. And this we know to be our truth, that that which we express within our very heart and life, that which we express within from the very essence of the divine, that God hears, knows, and understands, and is eager to unfold for us that very desire. For each one of us have claimed something unique for our own individual lives as we turn to the word of God, as we look for inspiration, as we seek guidance and greater wisdom. We know that the Spirit is ever unfolding our highest and best, and we welcome this. For we claim it with great authority and knowing and knowledge that the Spirit is speaking right now to us individually and to us collectively. And we welcome that very inner voice awakening us. With great gratitude now we release this, knowing that this is our reality. This is our truth. This is what's transpiring right now. For we know that God is at work. We claim it together as we say, and so it is. Amen. Well, over the past few weeks, we've been speaking about gleaning wisdom and the importance of getting wisdom within our life. That the most supreme, the first and most important thing that we might do is to get understanding. So says the word of God, inviting us to this wonderful journey of learning, of education. That's why we're so big on education here at City of Light that we have for years have held class after class after class when many communities may not have classes and they rely only on a spiritual experience on Sunday mornings. We want to take you to a higher level of understanding. We want to work with you individually to help you to receive this spiritual growth and understanding that's so necessary for your life to flourish. We know that without a doubt, God's desire for you is your personal prosperity, your abundance, your blessing. For scriptures unfolded this down through the ages, time after time, echoing this wonderful truth for our lives. So we want you to know how to gain, gain that, how to gain access to the divine providence that's there for you, the divine blessing that's there awaiting for you. We want to help you on that journey. That's why it's so important that we encourage you to attend classes and have these one-on-one -on -one experiences where we can answer questions as you're seeking and searching. We want to see you empowered to your highest and best. Now, the study of truth is very important, and gleaning wisdom, that's great. That's wonderful. But you know what? It's the smallest part of our life's demonstration, because seeking and learning and education is the smallest part, and what is the greatest part? Practice, doing, experiencing. You know, there's a lot of things in life that we've spent time learning, haven't we? How many of you remember algebra class? Uh huh. And how many of you used algebra this morning? Okay, I see hands going down. Uh huh. How many of you studied a foreign language? And maybe you took French or German or Spanish in, uh, in high school or in college. And how many of you are using French or German or Spanish even yet today? You see, we learn these things. We've spent time, haven't we? but we don't utilize them. We don't experience them on a day-to-day -day basis. And what happens? It weakens. It slips away. We forget, don't we? You know, I struggled with my bonjour. I was like, oh my God, I can't even get my French out because it's so rusty. You see, we struggle with this. I grew up in an environment speaking Swahili. I used to be able to read my Bible in Swahili. I can't even read five or six sentences anymore because I've forgotten so much of what was that educational experience and growing up, living in East Africa and having a firsthand uh, experience with it all. But yet then when you're removed and you're not engaging in it, what happens? 
we forget, don't we? We forget so quickly. So to keep something in mind, we have to engage what we know on a regular basis. We actually have to do it daily, really. They say that the more you do something on a regular habit, the more it stays within you, the more you will hold on to it. So it's really about not just knowing something, but it's about experiencing it. It's about using it. It's about practicing and how crucial that is for our lives. Now, the scripture down through the ages has said, faith, faith, yes, faith without works is dead. You can have all the faith, the understanding of faith, all the power of faith that work within your life and say, you know, I've studied faith. I've learned the power of faith. I've studied all the principles of spiritual law. I know how to make that application. But if I don't use it, it's simply dead. It's there. And I have to say this, but I think we're living in a world of a lot of dead faith. People going to church, people going through uh, catechisms, going through Sunday school experiences, going through all kinds of church education, growing up, but yet somehow letting it slip away. And what happens is they're moving in a world that is void of this powerful education, of the application of it. There is faith that has simply fallen flat and dead in our world. We sometimes may think, well, wait a minute. For me to exercise, for me to really practice this, for me to really do something, I need to be an expert at it, you know? How many of you, the first time you rode a bike, you were an expert at riding bike? Hmm, I don't think so, because I think you got on and you were all a novice, right? You were all just starting to learning how, and you may struggle. You got on that bike and you tried to balance yourself, and you tried, and you tried, but you kept on doing it, correct? And as the more you did it, the more proficient you became at it. You didn't say, I'm not getting on that bike until I'm an expert. I need to be an expert first, and when I'm an expert, then I will get on that bike, right? Instead, you said, let me try. Let me experience this. And through experience, I will become a better bike rider. Well, so it is with our faith. People say, well, wait a minute. I can't really express faith. I can't believe for miracles. I can't really step out in faith because I'm not an expert at it. And you don't need to be. That's the key. You don't need to be an expert at faith. You just need to start practicing it. The scripture talks about faith the size of a mustard seed. A small amount, trivial little bit, little bit of morsel of faith, of belief and understanding. And when you put it to work, amazing things will start to unfold for you. The key is put it to work. Start experiencing it. The, how important it is because the, that we really say that action will bring about the development of it. The more you do something, the more it broadens and the more it strengthens and the more it becomes something that is really vital. How many of you go to the gym? And the very first day, you can't pick up 150 pounds or 200 pounds. You're struggling with that five pound. And you're looking, where's the two and a half pound? You know, where's that one? I, I can, can I pick that one up, please? You know, I'm trying to look so butch, you know, doing those curls. And then you realize you haven't holding anything in your hand. You know, oh, well, we, oh, that's right. You see, what it happens to be in our life is that the more we exercise the muscle, the more the muscle becomes stronger, right? But day one again. You're not a 300-pound body lifter, a weight lifter, uh, starting out from the get-go. It develops, it unfolds for you, and how important that is. Now, Jesus saw this. And as we look to the scriptures and the gospel stories, we find Jesus teaching the disciples, working with them every single day, helping them. They were in class, Disciple 101. Uh, they were like the Emerson Theological Institute 2,000 years ago. They were there under the wonderful instruction of the master teacher, Jesus. And as they, Jesus began to teach and demonstrate and show them the way, they loved all the demonstrations. They loved to see all the action. They loved to see the miracles happening. And then came the opportunity for them. Now we know the story of Jesus and the disciples crossing the Sea of Galilee in a boat and a storm rises up. Jesus is asleep. And the disciples are in panic. There's a storm coming. There's fear is rising up within them. We're going to get tossed to and fro. We may drown out here in the storm in the sea. Someone calm the sea. Someone do something. Wake Jesus up. They wake Jesus up. He calms the storm. But what does he say to those disciples? Why didn't you do it? Why didn't you do it? Now, here's the very principle that we see that so often in our world, we've made Jesus the great exception versus the great example. And we say, well, Jesus does all these things. 
And so that must mean that it's so great and so wonderful. I could never do any of this. Yet we find echoed over and over. And something that we keep forgetting is that he said greater things than this shall you do. So it's about you practicing, engaging. You, the invitation was there. In fact, Jesus said to his disciples, I have to go away. I have to leave. I have to depart from this because otherwise you're always going to be dependent on me. You're always going to say, Jesus, you do it. Jesus, you calm the storm. Jesus, you uh, manifest something miracle. You do it. You do it. You do it. People say, Jesus, take the wheel. Jesus says, honey, you take the wheel. I taught you how to drive. I taught you how to do all this stuff. You take the wheel. You see what it is that you need to demonstrate your faith. You need to practice what you believe. You need to step out in there. You're always turning over to Jesus and saying, Jesus is going to do it all for me. When Jesus said, I must leave, I must go from this world so that the, you will awaken to the power of the Holy Spirit, the advocate known as the helper, that spirit of God that's going to help you do what you are called to do, help you engage in the practical experience of living out that faith. So when it comes to this challenge that says, I'm going to believe for something amazing. I'm going to step out of faith. I'm going to step out in faith, and I'm going to believe for a miracle in my life. That wonderful spirit of God is saying, I'm there to help you. I'm there to, but you have to exercise the faith. It is you who does it. Now, Jesus was there walking on the water in the stories of the Gospels, and Peter stepped out of the boat. It wasn't Jesus stepping out of the boat. It was, and the invitation was, Peter, you step out. And demonstrate your faith. You start practicing it. You believe. If you believe it, you can do it. You see how beautiful that is. So the challenge for our spiritual life is that what we want to help you is for you today to start practicing, to step out in faith, and to believe for something miraculous in your life. How many of you said, this week, I'll do that? I will start believing for something, okay? I'm going to start believing for something. So, you know, that's great. So when we start seeing that experience within our life to say, I'm going to work that belief that says, I'm going to believe for something and start with something simple, maybe something very easy that you could attain, you know, something that you might say, uh, you know, a lot of people kind of laugh, but they say, I'm going to manifest and believe for a good parking spot in the parking lot. After about 25 times around, you do find one. But, you know, it's like simply about just believing this is it's going to hold unfold for me. And I must say, we laugh at that simple illustration, but it's like starting somewhere where you start exercising faith to say, I'm going to believe for something. Because too many times we say, you know, if I don't start exercising faith and believing for anything to manifest or to happen with my life, well, I just let life go by and nothing happens. We get nothing because we haven't used the power within us and how important that is that we do this. You see, for Jesus, like every teacher, the dream was that the student would be independently using the knowledge. So every Bible story you're reading is there as an educational tool that's saying, here's how to do it. Now we're expecting you to do it too. And so we read these gospel lessons. We read these stories. We read them and we realize they're really our story. And they're trying to help us to see ourselves and the journey that we're called to do, that we may really embrace this type of abundant life that he's speaking of. Because it's not so much what you read or study, because it's what you do with what you've read or studied. So you can read. I got some people who've read the Bible 12 times through, you know, uh, in just a matter of months or years. And people said, you know, I've read the Bible through. What, what are you going to do with that education? What are you going to do? You read the Bible through. Now, how do you apply it? How do you put these scriptures, these powerful truths, these illustrations into action into your life? Because reading the Bible is a lovely spiritual act, but going beyond it and where we exercise it and we put it to work is really what matters. So we have to look to say in our own life, what is it that sustains us? Okay. Now, the scripture says, man does not live by bread alone. Okay. I love that because sometimes it's cake, dessert, uh, you know, sweets, cookies, right? No, no, no. That's not what Jesus is saying. It's not just bread. He's saying it's not just the physical bread that you live by, but there's a spiritual feeding for your life that you truly exist by. Yes, the physical body is nourished by the wonderful meals that you partake in, those delicious uh, meals, uh, vegan, vegetarian, or carnivorous. 
whatever it may be, uh, however you may be in your journey or what you're like. But those delicious meals are nurturing you with all the vitamins and proteins. But remember, that's just your body. You are not this body. You are that spiritual being within the body. What's nurturing that spiritual being within you? This is how it's so important to understand that what nurtures you is truth. That's right. The spirit, the soul, is fed by the very truth of God, the very truth, the very principles of God. They feed the soul. Oh, and you feel so nurtured and full and strengthened by when you begin to study and learn basic principles of the divine, basic principles of God, very basic spiritual truths. You learn them. You know, like trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not on your own understanding and God will direct your paths. What a wonderful truth that is, you know? It's a beautiful thing that you just learned. If I trust, I know the promise is God will direct my path. Now, the path, that word alone suggests that you're moving on a pathway, okay? A lot of us just say, well, I'll trust in the Lord while I sit on the sofa and eat potato chips and watch soap operas, and I'll expect God to unfold something for me. But it says it will direct your path, which suggests that there's some sort of movement that you're going on. And God's going to direct you and show you. So you step out and you start moving in that path. And when you do, there is direction for your life. That's a spiritual truth. And when you feed on that, when you grasp that, and you say, oh, that nurtures my soul. God is directing my path as I move, as I move forward, as I step out, as I practice how beautiful it is. God is there to strengthen me. So one of the beautiful things might be a simple exercise for you to do this week. Every few minutes, every hour maybe, but throughout the course of the day, feed on spiritual truth. Now, over the past few months, we've talked about our affirmation jars. We gave them out during uh, the pre-Easter season, and you were able to pull out a daily affirmation. Why do we want that? Why do we encourage you to do that? Why do we even participate in that? Well, because we want you to understand that every day we want you to be nurtured, your soul to be strengthened, to be fed by some spiritual truth. So you reach in the jar and you pulled out this wonderful truth and you read it, you thought about it for the day. Well, you may not have that affirmations anymore. You may have completed the jar and pulled them all out and maybe thrown them away. So what else do we do? We may write down some truths on three by five cards and have them available for you. That you may look at those and you may feed the soul every single day of the life of your life. Nurture it. Because this is what really strengthens. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we had such an appetite for truth? We say, oh, I'm so hungry for truth. Mm, I can feel my stomach growling, my soul growling, my very inner being growling, Say, oh, can I get a bite of truth? Can I get a little something to nurture me? Can I get a little something that I can just feed on, that I can bring my soul some strength and nurturing and how important that is for our lives? Can you imagine it was snack time instead of going for potato chips? We went for the truth of God. Can you imagine how our life might be when we begin to embrace what we're talking about is that we're nurturing the soul on a regular basis because as we do what we're doing, is simply practicing the presence of God. Practicing the presence of God. Now, the presence of God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, always with you. What happens is we lose the attention or the focus or the awareness that the presence of God has been there waiting and all around you. We get distracted, don't we? Shiny things, and there we go. You know, we just all of a sudden, here we go in our life, and we're all drawn away. And we, wait a minute, what about the Spirit of God, the presence of God? Oh, I'm chasing after this shiny thing here. You know, it's got my attention, and all of a sudden, I'm running after this or that. And that happens within our spiritual lives that we need to be brought back to the focus. It says every single moment. That's why the suggestion may be on an hourly basis. I've had people set their watches so they go off with a little bit of alarm that says, okay, read a spiritual truth. Take it out of my pocket. Take a three by five card or, or look up a spiritual truth or have them on their uh, cell phone apps or something like this. So that they've got some place where no matter where they are, they're constantly feeding and nurturing, strengthening the soul and practicing the presence of God. In fact, practicing the presence of God is really made easy. It's very easy. How is it easy? What do you mean it's easy? What are you talking about? 
I, I think that could be kind of challenging to always pull out a card and all this kind of stuff. Hey, but I want you to know this, that the presence of God is eager and ready to work within your life consistently and constantly because it's something that we call grace. Grace. We live by this truth, and what happens is then we get fed by this wonderful grace, which is God's goodness. Now, I grew up with, as a preacher's kid, hearing the word grace. Grace was like, yeah, God gives you grace because, honey, you've been really bad. And you're just lucky to get some of God's good favor who's going to say, you know, even though you've been so horrible, you've been so terrible, you know, there's a li- you're just lucky God isn't going to destroy you and blow you up and strike you with lightning or whatever it may be. Well, you know, I was kind of like, that was my idea of grace. I was kind of like, well, you know, I'm just lucky to have it, you know, fortunate enough, you know, and just uh, my good chance that I, I got some grace here. Let me tell you this. Grace is God's grace is the gift of God freely given. There's no luck involved. It's not like you're just, you made it by the skin of your teeth and you're lucky enough that some little grace got there and God made a way for you uh, graciously just because. God was looking favorably in this moment upon your life. Let me tell you, this grace is something wonderful that you can live with. I had a friend who was all confused about grace. I had a conversation with his partner. Uh, and she, his wife was saying, wait, 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 grace? You're talking about grace? All the- Who is this grace? <laughs> What's going on? You've got to tell me about this. Oh, honey, it's this divine grace. You're telling me she's divine now? What's going on? I want to know more about this grace that you're going on. Are you cheating on me with grace? What's going on here? Oh, grace, it's loving grace. Loving grace. This is even worse. You're getting deeper and deeper in this. Because what happens now? You're into all grace. Who is she? I want to meet this grace. You know? It's like, grace, what are you wearing? Khakis. Mm-hmm. Sure. She sounds ugly. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. You know that commercial? We get all confused what grace is. What grace is, is this wonderful gift of forgiving, empowering, love that's always there. It says practicing the presence of God is easy. And if you thought you made a mistake, don't worry. There's grace. And if you thought you stepped out in faith and it didn't manifest for you the way you wanted it to or you thought it would, that's okay. That's all right. Because grace is there saying, I love you. I love you through everything you go through and every shortcoming and every time you miss the mark. We talked about last week about sin. All those extra S's, remember? Yes, we had to talk about it because sin is presented in some context as way as being just something so horrible and so uh, ridiculously uh, enabling for pe- people that just makes them Sink to the bottom of the level. Let's just talk about what that word really is. It means you miss the mark. And when you miss the mark, sometimes it's important that you just pick yourself up and you try again. And that's grace. And grace says it's okay. If you miss the mark, you're not going to be destroyed or refused or saying, you know, there's no part or place for you. Too many times we found in spiritual communities or self-help groups that say, if you're not following the rules the exact way, honey, you've got to leave. You've got to go out. you can't, you got to quit. I had some friends who were in AA, and when the AA group would meet and they said, you know, uh, they're offering us the opportunity to stand up and say, hi, my name is Paul Gretz, and I'm an addict or I'm an alcoholic. And uh, how wonderful is every applause? You get all this good attention, and you get these little um, medals when you've gone so many uh, weeks or months uh, with sobriety, and then saying, I just don't want to tell them the truth is I slipped up. Because if I tell them the truth that I slipped up, I won't be revered or honored or celebrated. And I don't want to really be honest then. So maybe it's better I just lie about it. We find that in spiritual communities. People aren't ready to stand up and say, hi, my name is Paul Gretz and I sinned. I've fallen short of God's glory. I made some mistakes. We, we could, oh, ooh, shame on you. Oh, and we knew that about you. Uh, yeah, and we go, oh, yes, mm-hmm, yeah, uh-huh. We knew you were that type, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, so making mistakes all the time and, you know, sinner, it's full of sin, you know, and we kind of make it all kinds of evil instead of understanding that God's grace is there and we don't condemn and we don't punish and we don't try to beat people down. We uplift and we certainly don't say, if you don't toe the line, you're out. That's not the way it is in God's grace. 
God's grace says, if you make a mistake, that's okay. We're with you. We're there to empower you, lift you up, and encourage you, support you in the process, and help you to say that next time it's illustrated by the archer pulling the bow back and releasing the arrow. Oh, missed the target. Next time picking up the bow up and releasing the arrow and coming close to the bullseye. And the next time releasing the arrow and hitting the target. Because each time you may miss the mark, it's learning through those experiences that God's grace is there to pick you up and say, let's go at it again. Let's do it again. You can do it again. Come on. Come on. Do not give up. We're not letting you give up. That's what grace is all about. And that kind of grace is what we're called to share with one another. To be in that kind of spirit of grace that says practicing the presence of God is really easy. And if you screwed up and you didn't do well at it, we're there for you. We don't kick you out. We love you. We support you and we encourage you. So let's go back at it. Let's start believing together again. Let's begin to pray with one another again. Let's encourage you one another with one another again. Let's offer this kind of spirit of support and strength because that's what it all is all about. It's this wonderful saving grace. Now, Scripture says you're saved through grace. We're saved through this grace. We're saved to the understanding of what it really is saved. Being saved is really becoming that new creature. How do you become a new creature? Well, you become that new create, cre that new create creation, that new creature in God when you begin to welcome a change. How do you make a change? You welcome a new thought. Ah. I understand what that salvation experience is all about. We've gotten so confused sometimes that we think, oh, I'm going to accept Jesus into my heart, and that's going to be all I need to do. A lot of people have accepted Jesus in their heart, and they go back, and they keep missing the mark. But it's when we make the choice to follow the teaching of Jesus that says, I'm going to be a new creature in Christ, and I'm going to make a change in my life, and I'm going to make that change by starting to think and believe in a new way. Because what worked for me before, well, it wasn't working. What I thought was working ain't there anymore. Let's go and make a new direction. Let's choose a new pathway. So we're saved by this wonderful grace of a transition within our life, of a change, of a new thought within our lives. And that wonderful grace says, go ahead. You may have thought differently before, but now there's a new way of thinking for you. And we love you. The spirit of grace within the community of Christ is there to support you. And certainly the spirit of grace in God is there full of this wonderful support for you, saying, I'm guiding and I'm forgiving, even if you miss the mark. And you can continue practicing, knowing that practice is made easy through this wonderful grace. Now, today's generation, what are they all about? Experience, right? Everybody wants to have an experience, you know, like, Oh, you know, I'm not really good at sitting in church or going to classes. I want to have an experience. And let me tell you, the inviting this generation today to have this spiritual experience is so crucial for them to try it firsthand and to see that this teaching, that which we believe, that which Jesus laid down for us as a foundation, it works. It works. It actually works. And so when we understand that, our problem is uh, today's generation is they're looking for experience. I'm going to invite you, you know, to have one of these wonderful, really moving experiences by testing the truth and allowing it to prove itself to you, uh, living it, standing in it, and finding out what it reveals because we will know the truth by the fruit of that truth, by how it works within our life. So when we say, I'm going to claim a promise of God and I'm going to live by it, that that which I sow I shall also reap, for as a man thinketh, so he is. When I look at these principles, and I say, wow, they really do work. Because as I go out thinking in the affirmative, thinking in the positive, thinking in the wonderful way, and visualizing and imagining and putting it all together, this wonderful power of positivity together, I am exactly that. And it unfolds for me, and it works for me. How beautiful that is when we understand that we uh, will know by the experience, the very proving and the revelation, the understanding of the truth by experiencing it. But to experience it, you got to practice it. You got to do it. One thing to learn it, but you got to put it into action. You've got to do it yourself. Scripture is saying then, in essence, use it or lose it. That's right. It's either faith that's alive or faith that's dead. Which will it be for you? 
Will you engage that faith and practice it on a regular basis? Or will you allow all that understanding of spiritual truth just kind of slip away? This is where I'm inviting you to be that person who steps out and says, I'm going to believe for something great within my life. I'm going to believe for healing. I'll believe for health and strength. I'm going to believe for my own personal prosperity or unexpected income to come my way. I'm expecting that God's going to provide in unique ways that may not even believe that or that I even knew or thought of and how unique and wonderful they may be. So the challenge today is that people of faith, we must live the life of faith to be people of faith, to understand this grace that makes it so easy to practice, to really experience the fullness of God. I know that that grace is there to help you through everything. And with that, then we know that we constantly go inside instead of looking outside. We go inside, within, knowing that the power and the presence of God that Jesus imparted that Jesus taught the disciples, is the same for us yesterday, today, and forever. It is there for us to engage. So we go within, not looking outside for the answers, for faith to be demonstrated, but go within for us to begin there and start demonstrating the faith. This I believe. Could you fill in that sentence with something there? This I believe. And what is it that you believe? Then practice it. This I believe. What is it you believe? God is love. Practice it. What else would you might say? Someone else. What would you feel in that line? This I believe. Abundance is coming my way. That's what you're going to practice this week then, okay? Good. What else? This I believe. Somebody else? I'm forgiven. You're going to practice that this week. You're going to know you're forgiven, and you're going to be forgiving others. This I believe. Somebody else? I'll be a better listener, and there you are as you begin to practice that. Over here. This I believe. I am healthy, and you are, because that faith that says, I believe it, I practice it, I live it, I engage it. And you know what? If you slip up in that process, the grace says, let's start again, because the power of your believing then is at work for you. So in conclusion, what we want to understand is we practice, we practice. We learn, but we practice, and we use it. And as we do, we never lose it. And this is God's great truth for our lives. Amen.